Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It is your lovely host, Jake, here, and I'm with the fantastic... Peachy May. Yes, guys, welcome to Hot Topic. Woo! Yeah, in the building. Thank you very much. So, what fun things are we exploring today? Well, we've got some amazing things lined up for everybody. Well, of course, I don't know obviously. if you want to kind of talk a little bit about it. Well, it is, it is, it's, it's going to be an education learning about this. So, uh, I was very, very lucky to talk to the wonderful Joel Hopkins, a very wise man who knows a lot about teaching and gave us some real insights in what it means to be a man in education. So we're going to be talking to him first. Then we're moving on to the wonderful... Gina. Gina. <laughs> Fabulous drag the queen. Gina Grigio. <laughs> not to be underestimated at all. A fearsome, fearsome performer indeed. Love a fierce. Performer. Absolutely, she's just <laughs> honestly, she's here, she's loud, she's proud, and we got a very, very special performance in the studio from her today. So that's something you've got to be look forward to. Amazing stuff, and for all the Harry Potter fans out there who are waiting on platform nine and three quarters, we have the fantastic Chris Rankin, who played Percy Weasley in the Harry Potter films ones through eight. I know this is technically seven, but eight <laughs> because they're in two parts. Don't agree with it. And we're going to be talking to him, well, not us, our fabulous presenter, Chris, is going to be talking to him about all sorts of things, exploring his acting career and how life is changing throughout the pandemic. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It is Jake O'Neill here with Hot Topics. And today we're gonna to be carrying on the series about masculinity, exploring what it means to be a man in today's world. And to do that, we have the very, very lovely Joel Hopkins with us. Give us a smile, smile for the camera. All right. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. So Joel, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, so I'm a teacher. Uh, I teach in a primary school in Oxford um, called St. Ebbs Primary School. Um, I've been teaching for three years, just finished my third year of teaching. Um, I, start, I started off um, teaching from, basically I got an, ex, um, an offer to go to Kenya for a year, um, where I worked at an international school, an international private school, yeah. and um, basically went in order to try and explore the world, didn't really think about the job just knew that I had to have the job to be there. Yeah. Um, so I, I was a teaching assistant, um, working with British qualified um, teachers while I was out there. So, just briefly, what does it mean to be a man, a man in education to you, a man in education? So I'm a primary education teacher, and that's a real point of difference. Because the, the older the children are, the more men are usually interested in teaching something that they're passionate about, mm. one subject. Being a man in education for me is about being a positive role model, but also showing boys and girls that men can be whatever they want to be. Yeah. Um, and not pigeonholing anything, saying, this is me as a man, this mm. is me as a man teacher, mm. but this is not what all men are like. You told us about zones of regulation. Could you quickly explain those? Yeah, so um, what we teach children is that their emotions aren't something to be scared of, but they are something to be managed yeah. because you can only be your best self within one area. Yeah. And we call that the green zone, the ready to go zone. Mm -hmm. um, that's feeling happy, feeling content, feeling well rested. But we understand that people don't come into work like that. Mm -hmm. Adults don't come into work like that. Mm. Children definitely don't because their their bodies are changing and they're they're always going to be under different stresses than we are. Yeah. And different triggers will affect them that we are. If we give them an emotional vocabulary that helps them to explain their emotions, they can use that far easier than saying, I'm feeling a bit anxious. They'll say, I'm losing a bit of control. I think I'm in the yellow zone. I'm feeling like this. Red zone is explosive. Red zone is complete loss of control. Yeah. And blue zone is no control, but in a, in a, 
a sad, low energy emotional state. And what we do is we give children these zones so that they can have the emotional, they can have emotional literacy. They can explain what they're in and why they're in that zone. So what does being a man in general mean to you? I think I'm very proud to be a man. I'm very, I subscribe to the idea that I'm a man. Yeah. But I, what I don't subscribe to is the fact that it's people's narrow view of what a man should be. Yeah. I think there's so many things that I traditionally fit into that bubble and I fit into that mold of what people see of me mm. and, and being a man and being masculine. But I also don't think that being a man means that you should exclude yeah. and say, well, that's not a man because mm. of this, or you're not a man because of this. I think the broader that we make the spectrum of man, mm. the more diverse we make it, the richer it's going to be. Mm. It's this, and then the narrower you make it, the more toxic it becomes. Yeah. If you feel that being a man is this set thing and this set thing only, yeah. then everything else is antagonistic. Mm. Everything else goes, well, that's not what I am. Why do you make being a man and what that means to you? Yeah. You can say, well, I'm this. I'm happy to be here, mm. but actually, if you're here, that's fine. Mm. Yeah. You know, and you're also a man because you say you are. Like, and that that's the thing that we, we're so polarized in yeah. society at the mm. moment, that being, being a man doesn't have to mean this or this. If it's this, everyone's happy, <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Um, so. I think that's what it means to me is, is that I'm I'm very happy being my authentic self. Awesome. Yeah. Fantastic. So uh, a broad church of man, I believe a you said earlier. And like uh, the more inclusive it is, the better. And the less, the more people involved in it, less toxic it is because it's the exclusionary nature. And that's what I feel is a problem. Again, in a way, when you're talking about, um, you know, gender roles and so on, is that there is this kind of idea of, of the exclusionary nature of them is that you have to be a man to do this, you have to be a woman to do this, and if you're not one of these these particular, very narrow and almost con some sometimes really contrived ideas, mm. then you're somehow not a man. But absolutely, thank you so much, Joel. This has been absolutely fantastic. Uh, this is Top X News. Wonderful. So, Jake, please tell me about that incredible interview you had. Well, firstly, I want to say a quick shout out. Thank you so much once again, Joel, for coming. It's not your locality. Thank you for coming all the way here. Mm. Um, it was honestly incredible to speak to a person who knows so much about the emotional and mental state of children and about looking after people and raising people and the, the complexities of the language needed to look after children and make sure that they're being brought up and taught how to deal with their emotions and process things in a way that a lot of people haven't been. So it's very, very important stuff. And as a mother of a boy, I think that was incredible to watch because I was able to sort of find out, you know, how boys are taught, you know, how they taught their emotions. And that, for me, meant a lot. So next up, we have the absolutely amazing Gina Grigio. Um, you're going to get to see a live performance in the studio. She is a queen amongst queens of Cardiff's amazing drag scene. Uh, you're going to get to see her with her beautiful voice and... I just love drag. Like, I'm actually a secret fan of RuPaul's and I'm not even ashamed to admit it, so. <laughs> I'd love to see you in drag. I won't even lie. I absolutely love the drag scene. They are incredible. They are divas, they are queens, they are fierce, and I'm all about that. Mm, absolutely, I'm gonna lie, I'm not gonna lie, I do look pretty good in a dress, so. <laughs> man, like I've, I've got the legs for it, I've got the, you know, the hips and whatnot, so. But without further ado, let's bring in the wonderful Gina Grigio. Hello everybody and welcome back to Hot Topics. Today we're here with a very, very special guest who I have been very excited to meet. Thanks to Christian for sorting this out. Yes. So everybody say a warm and welcoming hello to Gina Grigio. Hi. Hi Gina. Thanks for nice to meet you Love finally. Mm -hmm. Like uh, like um, what's the deal about doing shows now on be before the like before after and during the pandemic for you because you're a big artist we're gonna talk about your career but what i really want to know is how what you girls doing it with all these things going on well before the pandemic just loving working in clubs getting drunk surrounded by drunk people <laughs> singing the you know the old show tunes a Absolutely. bit of a little mix having a whale of a time and then obviously 
no one foresaw this coming, yeah. and the build stopped. And one of the, the good things about our scene in Cardiff, without discussion, we almost instantly all just put shows on. All went online within a week. No one stood on anyone's toe, so on a Monday you'd have this person, on a Tuesday you'd have this one. Um, and then as the pandemic's gone on, it has got harder to keep your audience share, so you have to be quite inventive about what you're going to do. Everyone was doing cabaret shows and I didn't want to get lost. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. I did drunk makeup. That's amazing now. It's also very brave as well, because I've had a couple of people put eyeliner on me perfectly sober and they've nearly blinded me. So that yeah. is a very brave thing to do. Like, we did have a few mishaps. So the first week someone complained, well, a lot of people complained in the comments that I wasn't drunk enough. <laughs> <laughs> How much did you drink for that? Try harder. Well, probably get through three bottles of Prosecco oh. per show. I couldn't even do and that. And how long were the shows? An hour and a half. I mean, that's impressive. I, that I fully salute you. Yeah, yeah, yeah so the on first one I was too sober, and then the second one, uh, my mum lives over the road, and she had to come and turn my camera off because I'd fallen <laughs> off the stool. Because you're that drunk. Oh, Please yeah. tell me you uploaded that yeah. with your mum turning the camera yeah, off. That's amazing. I, I thought, that's do you know what? We're fantastic. all in this really weird situation where there isn't a rule book on how to deal with this. So yeah. Yeah. let's just talk. Let's be human. How, how did you become Gina? Like, how, yeah. how did that yeah. start? Where did your journey begin and how did you get into this? Oh and God. how are you sat here like this so stunning today? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I mean, he's fed up with me telling the story, but we don't talk anymore, so F him. Um, I went on a date with a drag queen and he was just really rude. Uh, he was just really rude and quite well, How is he rude? Um, so he was like, have you, have you had Botox? And I was like, well, yeah, I've had Botox. He was like, maybe you should pay and have a little bit more. Wow. Like, well, have you had veneers? I was like, no, I've got crowns. Um, well, maybe just get whiter ones next time. Oh I was my like, gosh. at the end of the day, I was like, do you know what? You're not all that. Yeah. Oh. Well, if you think you can do it better, do it. So I did. And I proved them wrong. And when was this? Wrong. This was almost five years ago. I'm five this month. <laughs> Had you done any kind of performance before you started doing drag? Or? Um, you know, like the odd bit of drunk karaoke. Yeah. But you weren't like a Amdram? No. no. Really? No. I was going to say, what, 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 were you, what were you like as a, as, a, as a child? As a child, I was your typical grade A student, prefect house captain. Really? really? Glasses, braces, head librarian. Wow. Yeah. Fantastic. But did you knew that you were a queen, like, on the inside? Like, yeah. I don't know, like... No. That no, came I, later. I was, like, dead butch and straight and a bit of a slug, to be honest. My kind of big light bulb moment was during lockdown, really? um, because it w I could take time to look at what I'd achieved and what I needed to do, um, and you know, with drunk makeup, the bigger show I did, um, like nine thousand viewers. Oh, man. Oh, wow. That's great. Because, and I realised at the time as well, you know, we all put on the wigs and the dresses, and we go on stage and we do this character. But I'm inviting people into my house to see me. It's the real and you. And I was really, really honest. Like, you know, there were weeks when I was struggling mentally. Um, and at work, I talk about mental health quite a lot. And, yeah. you know. And how was it received? Was it received well? Really, really well. Amazing. And it encouraged other people to open up and talk about their own mental health. That is and amazing. It, it became less about the artistry of makeup and more about the having impact. a drink with your friends. Yeah. 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 I want to know, like, some of the funniest or most embarrassing things that have happened to you in this oh career. God. Pride Cymru, big show, big stage. I was really looking forward to it. And as they were introducing me, there was a security alert further down and they moved us and all scrambled around and moved everything to a different stage in a different area. And I was like, I need to drink. I need to drink to cope with this. <laughs> as soon as I walked on, as I was walking up the steps, the organizer said, one swear word and you're off. Well, I didn't stop. I didn't stop. I was stop. gonna say, how do you do that? I didn't stop swearing. But I have seen people be pulled off. But I was Were like, you off? No. But I was like that, that's, that's, walking on stage. But that's also got to be red rag to a bull as well. Like, if, yeah. you, if I'm about to go on stage and someone says, don't do that, you're like, well, I'm gonna go on stage and do, do that. Do that, you know, yeah. So we decided that we'd make this a little bit fun. No, they decided. Okay, so yeah, so we decided after <laughs> a few pints that we'd make this a little bit fun. Um, and we're gonna test, not just you, Gina, but we're gonna test our lovely Neve here. And we're going to have some drag-related trivia, okay. and you have to answer. But we have a special. Have you got the cat time? Yes. Here so we what? Are. So I thought this instead of as we didn't have a buzzer. Yeah. We were thinking about <laughs> something that buzzed, and yeah. I stole this from my cat Amalia. Thank you. 
So, when shout out to Amalia the kitty. The first person who knows the answer, instead of pressing a buzzer, buzzer you have to lean forward and like so. Maybe not so forcefully, that was quite aggressive. I was say, yeah, like a cat. Yeah. Like if Neve does this. This is the only way to break my cat has has in, in the UK, so please treat him with. Has been even reaching distance. Hmm. It's on. It does indeed. Okay, it does it's indeed. On. I mean, I, I better. Do, you, do, you, want to stand, do you want to stand up, Chris? You want to stand up? Get, get in between them. Get in between them. Okay. There you go. Okay, so. Oh, no, I'm scared. Why am I getting panicky? It's fine. And we now have Jake O'Neill from Top X News doing the drag trivia quiz. Ooh. Fun noise as well, hey? So, <laughs> question number one. I feel like the ugliest model ever off a game show. You look yeah. amazing. Glamorous assistant. Chris is my glamorous <laughs> assistant. Thank so, you. who is. The most popular drag queen on Instagram. Okay, you got it first. Willem. Gina, not what we have here. <gasps> then I know who it is. Okay. Is it going to be Ruth's makeup artist or? Hit it. You have to hit the thing. <laughs> oh, hit the broken glass. <laughs> oh, you don't almost... uh, Trixie. No. Right, so that's one, that's one answer each. We'll take that as nil point. RuPaul. Uh, Valentina. Actually, I would have thought so. No, it's Bianca Del Rio. Oh. I know. I thought RuPaul as well, um, but I, this this was this was Google search, very very up to date article. Okay. Um, so yeah, you can like the the production team are giving me questioning looks in the background, but this is this, <laughs> I, I don't argue with it. Google because Google checks all my. You don't mail, get so Abby on this. I can't regard as an <laughs> avid drag race fan. So okay, so maybe she consulted with her first. Okay. So by the way, also you have to make the cat noise when you hear it. So you have to go. Wow. Yeah. Cool. I'm done with that. We're well, adding that in. This now, is so. a new rule. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Neve just wants to do it because it gives her more of an advantage. So, okay. I'll then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Question number two. What are the advantages of gluing eyebrows? Oh. Um, firstly, when you conceal them, you can like conceal it way easier because not the hair they're flat to your face. It makes it easier to apply the makeup on top for sweat. Don't get all the makeup there. All that shit. There we go. That is what we have here. Yeah. There are none. Shave them off like I do. There you go. Okay, so it's actually moving so far. Point to Gina. So, yeah, point to Gina. Uh, she is the expert, so. Yeah, um, just shave them off and draw them back on like I do. So, <laughs> question number three. What does tucking entail? Ow! Sorry. Gina again. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it is the placing of your PP um, back up inside you mm -hmm. to give the illusion of um, a smooth hump. As I like to call it. A smooth hump. Very nice. That would that hundred percent correct answer. Yeah, Sorry, that's right. like yeah, that is a posh drink. The smooth I need that. Hump. Smooth hump. Yeah. Can this is what you should serve on your drag train. All right. Now this one's a little bit of a international one, shall we say? So we have the names of three Chilean drag queens oh. are based purely on their names and nothing else. You have to guess which one has the most followers. So this is quite confusing because some of them have very similar names as well. So okay. we're keeping it nice and nice and confusing for you. So I have pictures if you want have, to see. We have pictures. We, we have, have pictures. pictures. Okay, yeah. that would make things pictures a little will bit help. easier. Yeah. I um, say no pictures. You say right, no then. pictures. Yeah. Yeah. No pictures. Right. So, Let's keep the guests happy. We have Labotota Fox. Labotota Fox. Okay. We have Zulma Laboto. I'm probably really, really hashing up the pronunciation here. And we'll then we have Janine Day. First one, I'd say. First one. I'm gonna go Janine Piss. Day. Okay, so you you thought it was Lobota Fox. That yeah. was the first one, and you think Janine Day. Oh, Gina, I'm very sorry to say that Lobota Fox is the correct answer. Thank you. With how many? How many followers? And do you want to take a rough guess? <laughs> um, it's more than me. God, don't get this in. What um, does what does it mean, Lobota? It's Labotota, actually. Labotota, yeah. Like, there we go. Uh, if you said it like that, I'd have guessed it. Yeah. Labotota. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm going to guess 230k. I'm going to guess. Is this for extra point? Okay. 35,000. Neither of you are correct, but, but Neve is closer. <laughs> 954,000. Oh, she's pretty good. Yeah. This is rigged. Look at it, I'm literally <laughs> on the edge of her seat, like. I'm so <laughs> ready. The mouse is moving. The mouse Out is of Chris and I. Which one of us do you think is most likely to have spent the evening with a drag queen? Chris. No, oh, I'm going to say Jake, 100%. <laughs> no offence. No, 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 the no, with these student. shirts, they'll love these shirts. I'm the drama student. Um, and yeah. I'm the exotic Latin guy. <laughs> Absolutely, so... I say Jake, you say Chris. Is this, is this a story? We're gonna, we're, we need to know afterwards. Guessing. No, we need to know afterwards where this has come from. So who is it? It's technically a trick question because neither of us have spent the night with a drag queen in that sense. However, um, my sole adventure to a gay club did Wait, end... Wait, so it was you? It was me. 
Um, so, Neve, I'm really sorry, Gina. Um, the house yeah, always wins. Now, you are the closest. I was the closest because I have performed topless karaoke. Well, it wasn't topless originally. It was uh, topless encouraged by the drag queens doing the DJing and singing Gimme, Gimme, Gimme. I want to see that. I've done that too. Was this a and now for the live yes, was performance. Was it in a cage with Was chains? it jingling over? It might have been. <laughs> are you not a fan? No, no, I'm just my sister. Oh, she's your sister? Yeah. Oh, she, she wouldn't put up with this fixed toys there. <laughs> it's not a fixed quiz. Well, I want more questions I'm going to sit down and finish the show with the, with the, with the toy. you got to finish the show with one hiss. Yeah, with one, one big hiss with a final and one hiss. big paw. And you win anyway, really, because, well, yeah. you know. Go on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. You've been watching Hot Topics with me, Gina Grigio, and these, but you know, that's not that. <laughs> Stay tuned for an exclusive performance. Jake, that was incredible. The cat toy was hilarious. What did you think about that? Honestly, I was so lucky to see her live, and I really, really am looking forward, now that we're all live, music all is okay in Wales, now we're on Freedom Day, to go and actually cat some of our shows, and watching them on social media as well. Very excited for that. Very excited indeed. I'm hoping to see you in drag. Mm, I think <laughs> I could pull it off personally, but we haven't got time just at the moment, and I think, not sure our viewers want to see that, but moving on, we have something incredibly magically exciting, one might say. Magically exciting? I think we're jumping on the Hogwarts Express. <laughs> <laughs> Platform nine and three quarters running straight through that invisible wall, <laughs> woo! We have the amazing Chris Rankin here, and we're talking to him all about acting and the kind of issues surrounding child, child actors and what it's like to be in a production for that long and for it to be that part of your life so very very exciting and he's talking to our lovely top x's own chris so take it away hello friends on topics news and hot topics right now we're gonna have a very cool and interesting conversation with an actor that it's not from around here he comes from new zealand but he's been on the uk for a long time now so he's actually kind of local in a sense but the cool thing about him is that he started on a very popular and very cherished franchise like harry potter but from that he has branched so to so many stuff that it's going to be very cool to actually talk to him and getting to know about him a little bit better so welcome to my friend chris rankins how are you man i'm good thank you so much for having me chris it's a great great pleasure to be here yeah, yeah, we're very happy and humbled to having you here because I know that you have a, a bunch of stuff going on and you took the time to talk with us and we're just starting, so I'm very grateful for that, man. Oh no, it's no problem at all. It's exciting, it's exciting to be part of the launch of this, so it's, um, yeah, it's a good time. When did you knew that you were going to be an actor? That's a really good question. I think, I mean, the honest answer is I think I realised I was going to be an actor when I got the part in Harry Potter. Okay. Uh, because because up until that point, I I loved performing. I started taking it. I mean, I, I was always performing as a kid. I was I, I I've been musical. I started playing the violin when I was three. As you can see, there's a selection of things on the wall. If I just move that, there's, there's yeah, I can see that. I can see that really cool guitar, <laughs> man. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was twenty quid off Amazon. I can't even play that. That was <laughs> that was an early <laughs> lockdown kind of right. I'm going to learn the guitar. Never did. Um, but it looks nice on the wall. Um, yeah, it does. But yeah, no, I've been I've been musical. Like I've sort of grown up being a musical kid and performing that way. Um, I was always quite a shy child though, so it was um, it was it wasn't something that came naturally to me as a performer. Um, but I think I got into acting really probably when I was when we moved to this country when I was six or so, and we started going to see uh, pantomime. Uh, ah, okay. Which, you know, it's the great British Christmas theatrical tradition of, you know, of, of pantomime is, um, and I don't, I don't know if there's people listening to this abroad or, I mean, it is essentially um, musical theatre for the family, specifically orientated at the whole family. So from two, three year old kids all the way up to sort of 80, 90 year old grandmas and granddads um, that is traditionally performed at Christmas. It was a bit of an eye opener for me and I absolutely loved it. It was when I was about 11 or 12 when I started high school that I started getting into really performing. I did I did a musical at high school uh, called Bugsy Malone when I was 11. It was the first thing I'd done. 
like one of the good things about the movies, like I'm an, I'm not an actually Harry Potter fan, but I can acknowledge that is that all the kids in the movie look like they are having a good time doing it, and they are not like dealing with the pressure. The people that are were in charge of that made a really good job of let you guys just do your thing and not feel like the industry pressure of oh I have to perform because we have to make millions of dollars and blah blah blah. They did a very good job at that, man. Oh, they did. They completely did, and I, I, put, I give a lot of credit for that to Chris Columbus, who directed the first two films. Um, who not only is a genius at getting brilliant performances out of kids, you know, he famously, other than Harry Potter, he famously did uh, Mrs. Doubtfire and yeah. Home Alone, and you know, he wrote The Goonies and other things. You know, but he's and Gremlins. Um, but his attitude to working with kids, I think, is is incredible. You know, that you. You, you are never you're never chastised you're never told you've done that wrong we need to do it again because you screwed that up it's always that was great that was absolutely spot on that's brilliant we're gonna go for another one just let's do it again. you know there was never yeah you never felt like you were going again because you'd screwed up or because there was never any pressure now i run a um amongst a million other things i run a community theater group that have, we, you know we have children aged eight upwards and you know you treat you have to treat kids to some degree in the same way that you treat the adults you know everyone is expected to be you know bring the same amount of energy and discipline to everything but equally you can't put the pressure on the children and especially when you're making a film like say harry potter where the title characters you know the entire film rests on the shoulders of three 11 year old kids as the first two did at no point was there any pressure at no point did any of that kind of come to rest on you, you we would we were protected very very well, I, and I do a lot of stuff with the fan community around Harry Potter as well. So I, I talk to people about this a lot. But Percy is very often overlooked as a know-it-all, do-gooder, um, pompous, arrogant. Uh, you know, take will will do anything to get ahead and abandon his family along the way, and he gets a lot of. He gets a lot of the, the rough end of the stick for that, I think. He gets a lot of grief for that. But I think there's a lot more to him than that. And I think the way I understood Percy and the way I try and kind of explain to other people is that he's kind of misunderstood in the middle because, you know, there's this sort of, there's this theme going through the books that, you know, oh, Percy, he's up in his room. He's always studying. He's always working so hard. And then Percy, you know, has to get all the sort of top grades all the way through. Oh, he has to be head boy. Oh, he's a school freak. Oh, he's work, You know, and it's always that kind of, oh, you know, I'm so good. I'm look at me. I'm so clever. And, and mm -hmm. I don't think he is. I think, you know, if he was that clever and that naturally gifted and brilliant, he wouldn't be working so hard. You know, I think I think if it was that if it became that naturally to him, he'd, he'd breeze through it. Where he's, he works damn hard for everything that he gets. He's you know he's constantly studying when he's at Hogwarts. He's constantly trying and trying and trying. So I think one of the things about Percy that I really like is that he understands where his weaknesses are and he works bloody hard to do the best he can to overcome his weaknesses. Hey man, I want to ask you a question. How was that the transition? from being like an actor and a child actor in these big productions to uh, start working more as an adult? I think coming out coming out of the other end of Harry Potter, which was, well, 10 years ago now, and I did, I, I struggled a lot with only being seen for kind of the same character as Percy, a lot of kind of, you know, sneery, snooty. I played a school prefect in something else, you know, I played another kind of, uh, you know, that sort of, pompous, arrogant, you know, I played a lot of Percy Weasleys. Uh, I didn't enjoy that, I have to say, um, because I feel like, you know, that is that is one thing I can do. It's not all I can do. Um, so towards the end of my Harry Potter time, I actually stopped acting for a while. I went off to university and uh, studied media production and went to work on the other side of the camera. And I spent five or six years, where, where are we? Yeah, five or six years working in film and TV production. I worked on some amazing shows. I worked on Downton Abbey as a production coordinator. I worked on a Kurt Sutter who did famously did um, Sons of Anarchy. He did a, he shot a 
pilot for a massive American TV show in Wales that I worked on. I did a couple of shows for the BBC, made loads of commercials and all of this, you know, behind the camera, very much sat at a desk doing the paperwork yeah. as a production coordinator. So, you know, organizing the shoot, hiring the crew and all of that kind of stuff. And I kind of, I lost a little bit of my love for the for the performing side of it for a while because I, I was struggling to get past Percy for a little while. Um, and it's only really in the last four years, five years or so, that I've started to kind of start acting again um, and enjoying it. And do you like being based here in, in Wales? Because uh, one thing I've noticed is like from from my experience living here is that there's a lot of cool things going on in the creative industries. I think Wales is a um, I think it's a fantastic place. I mean, I've, I've lived here 10 years, as I said, I, and I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't ever consider leaving. I think, I think more and more so in the last, I don't know, yeah, 10 years, it's mattered less as a as a performer or as a, an artistic or creative person. There's less requirement now for you to be in London on the doorstep, you know, ready to go at a moment's notice. Because you know, we do self tapes now. A lot of stuff is you know cast remotely through yeah through self tapes or through well Zoom. And I think especially over the last well two years 18 months of this pandemic is i think we've all started to realize that actually it doesn't matter you know you can be anywhere in the world and if if you're the right person for the job they will get you there but wales is an incredibly vibrant artistic place to live you know i mean the film in the film and tv industry here is exploding right now i think there's 25 film and tv shows shooting over the summer in Wales, which is that ridiculous. sounds really I cool. Yeah. Okay, so we're running a little bit uh, with the time, but I want to thank you, Chris, because it's very cool for a new media outlet like ours having a talk with someone that has the the super cool adventures and the super cool career that you that you had. Thank you very much, Chris. My pleasure, buddy. It's nice talking to you, and uh, good luck with good luck with the launch. I hope it all goes really, really well. Thank you very much to the wonderful Chris Ranking for a truly magical interview. I am ready to hop on my Nimbus 2000 and go and score all of the goals with all of the quaffles, and maybe get hit by a few bludgers as well. How about you? Speaking of magical, don't you have a train to catch? In fact, I think I do. I'm off the platform nine and three quarters, and I feel that it's gonna be like the Chamber of Secrets where I'm gonna keep ramming my head into a concrete wall, fantastic. Um, but you know what, we're gonna switch things up a little bit this episode and I am going to apparate out of here and uh, my good friend, Chris, is going to use the flu powder to teleport in and take my place. In fact, is it really flu powder or is it polyjuice potion? Okay, uh, I don't know what I'm doing here, Peaches, but uh, <laughs> since Jake had to take the train, I'm coming in and we also have our new latest presenter my friend Isaac my, what's up man my one and only son <laughs> hey it's a lovely kid Thank uh, you Isaac much. yeah tell um, me something what are we want to watch on the TV um, now about what's this that we're watching um, what is it called Puppy. <laughs> okay so you know that we have our wall of fame of influencers but today we have kid friendly influencers picked by our friend Isaac so we're gonna watch Blippy or Flippy? I still don't know. Blippy, but this one likes to call him Flippy, so... Okay, let's watch. <laughs> okay, hey Isaac, tell me, why do you like this guy? Um, not because I like to have the Montevideo. Ah, uh, okay. Hey, Peaches, can you, like, explain me some of this? Because I don't understand nothing that I'm watching. I don't really understand it myself, to be honest, Chris, <laughs> but from what I, I can see, it's, it's educational, but... A little bit strange from an adult perspective. <laughs> yeah, but when we were kids, we watched strange stuff for our parents and we still watch, you know? That's very true. Okay. What he's doing with the... Do you know the difference between a stingray and a tuna fish, Isaac? <laughs> Me neither, really. <laughs> Tumbleweed. <laughs> <laughs> what does he do with him? I don't know. Searching ways! Very gentle with two fingers. Oh, that's oh, very good. Yeah, and educational. Where is he? The uh, where is he at today? I don't know. <laughs> He's doing a, a really aquatic dance, like the. 
it's an aquarium. Yeah. And where do you guys watch uh, watch this guy on YouTube, on Instagram? YouTube mainly. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Although he does have shows on Amazon Prime at the moment. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay, so he's doing okay. He is doing okay, surprisingly. <laughs> Which you want like better, the Power Rangers and the Mega Swords of this guy? Oh, I'm Isaac. Um, like your mother power when just and big massive warring Okay. T-Rex. Well, I think I'm a T-Rex guy too, man. I'm with you on that. Okay, so we're moving on to the other influencer. Is that okay? Let's move to the other influencer on our wall of fame. I, I know, look. <laughs> okay, so our little director here uh, took action of everything. We're gonna see one of your favorites. I think that's uh, what's the name of this pictures? Ryan's World. So Ryan's this one World. Okay. Is a McDonald's drive-through. Me, director. What do you like about uh, this one? Um, how about the fruit one, but not some of this. Oh, okay, that sounds reasonable. Okay, so now we're watching Ryan's, Ryan's. World. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I think that you like it, man. Hey, it's really cool. Like uh, Ryan's World, from what I've researched, uh, it's very popular and big around the world. You have like toy lines and a lot of stuff out there. It's huge, it's yeah, insanely huge. I mean, it's very cleverly advertised as well. I mean, Ryan's World itself is. A toy review mm -hmm. and it started off being a small program it's now massive and they're reviewing toys from all over the world so this is great for companies this is an absolutely fantastic way to monetize um, you know a brand and toys itself yeah of course it's really cool that something from the internet the influencers is just like getting out there and just like I don't know toys or comic books before I had their own shows and stuff yeah. now it's something that's out there and doing the same kind of cultural impact for kids and their parents like I don't know imagine getting this guy's toys for Christmas it's gonna be a nightmare oh they're running out you're gonna have Isaac asking the friend I don't know it's like the whole thing that comes when something make, uh, gets us this popular you know Bill thank you guys for tuning in and see you in the next episode of Hot topics. Hot topics, guys. See you later. Take care. But we've got to say bye to everybody at home. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> Stay happy and wise up. Wise up. Hi, I'm Gina Grigio. Pour yourself a glass, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a. No, I need to do that again. What about us? What about all the times you said you had the answers? What about us? What about all the broken happy ever afters? What about us? What about all the plans that ended in disaster? What about love? What about trust? What about us?